Hello and welcome to the Spike podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and joining me this week as ever, delighted to have Tom Slater, editor of Spiked. Hello. And Spiked columnist Inaya Falarin Iman. Hi. So today we've got plenty to talk about, but we're going to be concentrating on just one thing, the big story on everyone's mind this week, and that's the riots roiling England. But before we get into all that, I just want to say quickly, if you value the work we do here at Spiked, then please consider becoming a Spiked supporter. For £5 or more per month, you can support all of the work that we do, and you'll get a few extra perks for yourself in there included. To find out more, just go to spiked-online.com forward slash support. That's spiked-online.com forward slash support. Thank you very much. So the past week or so, England has been rocked by these pretty disturbing, disgraceful race riots. Things kicked off on Tuesday in Southport, the day after this horrendous killing of three young girls. Rumours spreading around that the suspect was a Muslim asylum seeker, completely untrue. Then on Sunday, we saw some of the most despicable scenes in, in, in Rotherham where people are you know, essentially ganging up on almost trying to set fire to a asylum seekers hotel. Tom, what have you made of these these scenes of the past few weeks? No, it's been absolutely horrifying. I think it's it's escalated so much since we last spoke about it this time last week. Um, and we shouldn't beat around the bush here when you're talking about people, you know, smashing up shops and homes in immigrant areas, shouting anti Asian racial slurs or trying to set fire to hotels that the crowd suspected had asylum seekers in. That we saw that in Rotherham. We also saw that in Tamworth. Um, if you're talking about the kind of mindless racist violence that we've seen, this is not, as some people were suggesting at one point on the on the kind of hard right Twitter sphere, a case of this is the roar of the unheard. These are legitimate concerns that have got ahead of themselves. It's obviously not that. This was an upsurge in racist violence. Um, and I don't think we should beat around the bush when discussing it in those terms. Um, I think we need to kind of get to grips with what brought us to this particular situation though. Um, and there's all kinds of things I'm sure we'll get into. But one thing that has been very striking about what we've seen across the country in recent days is that there's been a kind of toxic white identity politics, which is curdled amongst not many people. You're talking about handfuls of people in the grand scheme of things. Um, but amongst a tiny fringe, um, there is a sense in which all of the kind of self-victimization, all of the racial lens being applied to every single thing in society, combined with obviously an appetite for conspiracy theories and so on, has um, motivated people to go out and do the most horrendous things to their fellow citizens. And that's something that I think it is worth talking about because for a very long time in our discussions about multiculturalism and, and race, many of us were kind of arguing and warning that if you continue to encourage people to think of themselves in these racialized, ethno-religious terms, to see every slight through that lens, to see every social problem through that lens, even when it's not appropriate, um, to really kind of balkanize the country psychologically mm. in that way, um, that there is going to be at some point a small but still a significant section of the white majority who will begin to see themselves in that in those terms, or there'll be hard right agitators and propagandists who will weaponize that kind of language and say, why can't we play that game as well? That's been building in that space for, for a very long time. And it's something that we've seen bear sort of horrendous fruit in recent days. There's all kinds of things that we can talk about, of course, but I think front and center has to be that um, acknowledgement of just what um, uh, horrendous situation we've been confronted with is. Yeah, and no, I I mean that has been the sort of striking feature of this, this sort of the way that people are seeing themselves in in entirely racialized terms. Yeah, I mean it is really striking. I mean, you know, even when we saw the um riots at um the uh, scuffle that took place in the Manchester airport situation mm. and with the police officers, it was very interesting also seeing many of the uh um, Muslim community uh, in that area also see this as an attack on Muslims as a whole. Yeah. Uh, something that we had very little details of mm -hmm. and very little information. It's just very interesting now how so many different issues that might just involve um, or happen to involve people of different races. There are um, people in society that now instinctively see that as a fundamental attack on that group yeah. um, and seek to organize on that basis. And I think that Tom's uh, point about certain sections of the online right is uh, really on point one. I mean, just in some of the interviews and things I've been doing the last few days, I have been using the term, you know, far right thugs, um, because I think, you know, there are people in those riots that are I, I don't know what else to call them. I, I don't know if that's all of the people, but there's a sizable proportion. Yeah. And I've had, you know, 
dozens of people, you know, trying to tell me that I shouldn't use that term and that all of this absurd stuff. And I think just as we have to be able to describe what's going on um, and we have to be able to separate what I think are clearly um, serial delinquents. I mean, if you look at some of the, um, uh, the, the background of some of the people that have been already charged and convicted, some of them have upwards of 30 convictions. Yeah. Um, and many of them are, you know, jumping on um, a very real instance of social tension in order to wreak havoc. Um, and so that is, a, of course, should just be completely separated. And it is worrying that some people in certain sections of the online right are trying to say that this is some kind of authentic groundswell of the working class. Um, and I think that they're really in danger of um, creating a situation where you really alienate people that do have real concerns about the conversations and the way in which we're having uh, the direction of travel as a society. If you just try and suggest that this horrific behaviour that's gone on is somehow a kind of authentic expression of people. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, you know, looking at some of the polling, I think there's something like 7% of the public have sympathy with the rioting and the, and, and the actions, which is a tiny number of people. You'll find probably a similar number of people who are ultra woke or something like that. Um, you know, this is not a this is not a shared feeling. Concerns about migration or whatever, or multiculturalism, which I'm sure we come and can come on to, are are clearly not the same. And most most of the public understands that, but many people online do not. <laughs> well, I think it is though fair to say that you know these uh, individuals that have uh, engaged in these riots are clearly. Um, um, as Tom alluded to, exploiting or weaponizing what I think are pre-existing social mm. tensions and they were already there. And I think, you know, as we'll come on to talk about, you know, what were those social tensions? Um, why are people increasingly seeing themselves in racialized terms? And how, how have the conditions been created that there is a bandwagon that people can use in order to stoke further division? Yeah. And, and Tom, it's worth talking about the fact that it hasn't just been uh, white groups out in force, um, you know, causing trouble. There has been a reaction from some Muslim communities, particularly and notably in Birmingham. Uh, you wrote about this uh, earlier this week. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, this has been plastered across the news, of course, um, and social media, whereby you did see this response um, when there was rumours in Birmingham that there was going to be a far-right march, um, an attack on the mosque. So quite understandably, you have um, Muslims in that area deciding that we're going to kind of stand out to protect the mosque, that's something that you've seen across the country. But there's also this other gathering of um, predominantly young men around this roundabout nearby in front of a McDonald's, um, where that's clearly not that what they were engaged in. I mean, it was clearly something entirely different. It was just sort of thuggish behavior. They felt like they got license to do it. Many of them wearing balaclavas, some of them carrying weapons. You know, if they were really out there to defend their elders, I don't know why they were also doing donuts around the roundabout and things like this. It was clearly just a sort of form of... Um, sort of sectarian thuggery that they were engaging themselves One in. One claims they had a staff, not a giant stick, like the, for religious purposes, but I'm not sure. Sort of splitting can, hairs to a certain exactly, extent. People could make their own minds um, <laughs> and But it was obviously horrendous. Not only were they going around, there was some um, criminal damage, which is already taking place. They also smashed up this pub. They beat up a man outside, or a group of them, I should say, beat up a man outside a pub, actually sustained some quite bad injuries to his liver, I believe, from the beating that is, not from the pub. And um, what was striking... As has, as has been the case throughout this discussion again, is the sort of lack of police presence. Um, also, the tendency after the fact, as we saw from Jess Phillips MP, that's happened within her constituency, um, to try and sort of make excuses for it. She suggested that the original rumours, and they did turn out to be rumours of a far-right protest, were designed to flush out this kind of response. But the fact that it has flushed out that kind of response is still a problem. Mm. Um, there, were off, there were also comments from the local police chief saying that they'd been in contact with the quote-unquote community leaders. It's never entirely clear who that is supposed to be or who elected <laughs> them to hold that particular office, but there you go. Said that they didn't need, they could police their own youth as it were, so they didn't need them. To take that as red is a slightly strange sort of state of affairs. And whilst um, there's been an attempt to kind of draw on a kind of equivalence before what we saw in Birmingham, also saw it flare, flare up in Croydon and elsewhere, um, there's been an attempt to kind of draw an equivalence between that and the thing and the racist writing we've seen kick off across the country. And that's obviously ridiculous. But nevertheless, it does point to a particular problem, which is if you are in a position as the government and as the police force that you're trying to deflect and deny these accusations of two-tier policing, surely you'd think they would want to be on the front foot in terms of dealing with this form of sectarian violence as well. And yeah. the um, 
the refusal to do that combined with the denialism that this is even a problem mm. amongst the sort of great and good has been has been shocking and it's continuing to feed the narrative of people who, are, uh, who um you whose narrative you wouldn't want to feed shall we say so a horrendous yeah. own goal on their part yeah definitely i mean keir starmer has got this nickname now to tier keir even elon musk has been uh tweeting about it there is this denialism that there are, you know, any differences in how certain groups are treated by the the police, which again is it seems odd coming from the people who say that police are systemically racist and they always treat people differently according to their skin color. Now the narrative is the police would never treat anyone differently according to their background. What have you made of that kind of discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, even if um, there is not the full picture, the two tier Kia or the two tier policing, even if that was the case, you know, the onus I think as well is on, you know, our, our institutions to demonstrate to people that that is not the case. You know, if that there is that perception, I think that that really does undermine people's confidence and trust within institutions um, and the ability of the police and the state to actually, you know, carry out the things that they need to carry out. So rather than just engage in this dismissal, this contemptuous attitude towards people raising those concerns I think that we should you know take them seriously and I mean when there was that video that was circulating um, of the police officer saying um, well if you you know have weapons you know put them put them down you know in a mosque I mean a lot yeah. of people would understandably were like hold on a second like if people have like lots of really dangerous weapons yeah. you know that they're going out to essentially um, assault people um, that that that's something that should just not be allowed regardless mm. of, of the circumstances. Um, so I think that there are these individual um, situations, you know, people have also talked about some of the um, Palestinian protests in which there were people, and there's been videos of other things related to it, um, you know, shouting genuinely, you know, anti-Semitic slogans or or calling for things um, that, that created a, a a sense that this was not a welcoming place for certain groups of people. And there's been a laissez-faire attitude to, to um, talking about that. Now, I don't want to make, I'm not going to make an equivalent between between some of the things going on with BLM and, and um, the situation right now. But I do think that it is interesting that when there were riots going on mm. um, in, in the US, um, you know, police officers being assaulted, many people died during those riots. Yeah, I think 25 uh, people died during the BLM riots. It's worth remembering well, that. Well, exactly. The yeah. You know, businesses of, from all backgrounds were, were burnt um, and it was some horrendous scenes. During that time, if you raised any questions, you mm. were classed as, you know, a um, apologist for racism. Yeah. Um, so we can't have a situation that when it is a cause that people find favorable to their particular interests that all of a sudden you know concerns about uh, fair policing law and order um, get completely dismissed because mm. there will be other people that have a different cause and will use those same arguments um, and therefore I think the responsibility now is on the police and, and and the government to genuinely reassure people and condemn all acts of violence regardless of where it comes from. This episode of the Spike podcast is sponsored by AG1. Now, we all know that we need to look after ourselves, but sometimes that can feel like a bit of a chore, or at least I used to feel that way until I started drinking AG1. AG1 is a daily nutrition supplement that makes it easy to keep on top of your health. Just one scoop contains 70 high quality ingredients, all designed to meet your basic mental and physical needs. I usually drink AG1 on my morning commute. All I do is mix one scoop with water, and in less than a minute, I'm ready to get on with the day. That single scoop of AG1 contains loads of helpful stuff. Pantothenic acid supports your mental performance, ingredients like folate help to reduce tiredness and fatigue, and B vitamins help your heart stay healthy and strong. For me though, the best thing about AG1 is how much it supports my immune system. The vitamin C and zinc in my morning scoop have helped me keep off those nasty colds, even in the winter. This has made a massive difference to my day-to-day -day life. AG1 is also designed by a world-class team of scientists with more than 100 years experience between them. Right now, they're working to improve AG1 with new ingredients, so your morning scoop will only get better as you use it. So, if you want to replace your multivitamins and more, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription. Just go to drinkag1.com slash spiked. That's drinkag1.com slash spiked. Check it out. And Tom, I'm sticking with the sort of policing theme. Mm -hmm. uh, Keir Starmer has launched a crackdown uh, 
in relation to the right in response to the riots, not just on violence, which is fine by <laughs> anyone here, um, but also on speech, on what people say online, on disinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of nascent at the moment, but it's certainly very concerning. So alongside, as you say, the completely understandable desire to swiftly deal with the violent criminals and to get them locked up, there is this instantly it becomes a discussion about social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know this in, you know, anything can happen. It becomes a discussion about social media, but there we go. Um, very alarming, not only calling on the social media platforms themselves to do more, um, which basically means to do more censorship, to do more moderation, <laughs> yeah. um, to kick off the people that... Um, they see sometimes quite rightly as undesirables, but that's already kind of in the offing. We've also seen um, the chief prosecutor give this interview, which has been out across the media, talking about how we have police officers or we have officials scouring the internet, looking for people who might be um, not just kind of posting their own forms of hate speech and incitement to hatred and violence, but even just if you're retweeting it, if you're reposting mm. it, um, then you could also be liable. So it's, cre it's creating this very concerning atmosphere. Um, and it's one of those things where, first and foremost, it's quite clear that any kind of purge of social media or any kind of crusade that's whipped up around online speech is never going to stop at the truly hateful, inciting stuff that they claim that it's about. Um, even without getting into the whole question of like trying to define hate speech as yeah. a fool's game anyway. But still, it's quite clear that it's going to become a much broader crusade. You're already seeing that with the demands that reform MPs be removed from parliament mm. or all sorts of different people are apparently being blamed. The Daily Mail is being blamed, all yeah. these kinds of things. Um, th that McCarthy atmosphere, you can clearly see this isn't just about purging what is neatly defined as, you know, beyond the pale speech on the internet. Um, and also it's it's just really striking, I think, that this is that, that, that this is always the reaction tells us two things. One of which these people really are terrified of freedom of speech. It's like yeah. their kind of root cause explanation for absolutely everything that goes on goes wrong in society. Like censorship is the only thing between civilization and barbarism as well as <laughs> these people concerned. And it's a it's a quite a terrifying worldview if you do care about those fundamental liberties. It's also a complete displacement activity. Yeah. Everyone can see this. Why is Keir Starmer having this huge row, even if it's few kind of, you know, through the media and through intermediaries with Elon Musk, when not only does he have an uh, ongoing riotous situation to deal with, but also it has exposed quite deep-seated problems in the country. Yeah, These people are, for whatever else, despicable, con condemnable, all the rest of it. Also clearly a symptom of something else that's going wrong, even if they're not a legitimate response to it in any meaningful mm. sense. So it's always very easy, whether it's these riots, the murder of David Amos, anything horrendous that it actually requires a quite difficult and complicated discussion, you just blame it on the agitators or the social media companies. It's a cop-out as yeah. much as anything else. And I think we've seen that very clearly this week. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, some of the sort of most prominent liberals calling for sort of Twitter or X to be completely shut down, GB News to be taken off the air, Farage kicked out of Parliament. I mean, hashtag arrest Farage was trending for like most of last week as if yeah. he is somehow to blame just because he made some weird video sort of it, speculating about the, the Southport killer. It's honestly astonishing just the you know, ferocious, censorious instinct that you see in certain sections of the kind of media and political class. I just think, have you learned absolutely nothing? Even during COVID, the pandemic, when there was just so much censorship going on, if anything, that fueled the massive conspiracism that mm. um, ended up being unleashed as a result. I mean, this there is no evidence whatsoever that censoring speech, you know, as as we all know, has um, any concrete effect in the way of dealing with the root causes of, of the problem. And then now we've obviously got this new boogeyman as well that's been thrown in, which is the you know, Russian you know, disinformation as well. Yeah. You know, it's like, th this is, you know, can't possibly be anything to do with, you know, some of the real problems going on in yeah. society. This has to be manipulated by Russia. Um, and, you know, everybody is essentially just being manipulated. And yeah. it's just, it is really just quite shocking. And then, you know, even just some of the, things that some of the rioters were saying, like stop the boats. You know, there's discussions now that the you know, Rishi Sunak is somehow responsible <laughs> for the, the stop the boat slogan, which is regardless of if you agree with it, that's an entirely legitimate kind yeah. of political um, disagreement to have. Yeah. So what we, we're really seeing just a 
um, complete narrowing, an intense narrowing of any kind of discussion, anything that remotely questions um, many of the, the 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 liberal niceties that we've seen over the last few years. Definitely. I mean, I'm just sort of laughing at the image of these sort of uh, EDL type thugs hanging on every word of Rishi Sunak yeah. and Swella Braverman <laughs> <laughs> yeah. being whipped up into a frenzy. It's just just complete nonsense. Also sponsoring this week's Spike podcast is ExpressVPN. Not going online without ExpressVPN is a bit like taking your dog out without a lead. Chances are nothing will happen, but all it takes is some dangerous traffic and then you've lost your beloved pet forever. Some people just don't realize how risky it is to go online without using ExpressVPN. Every time you log into public Wi-Fi at a hotel, cafe or airport, you're putting your private information in danger. Hackers using the same network can gain access to and steal your data. It's scary how easy it is. Your personal info is a precious commodity and there are plenty of bad actors who want to get their hands on it. ExpressVPN helps you stay safe online by creating an encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. That means your data is safe from hackers. In fact, it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to crack ExpressVPN's super secure encryption. You don't need a supercomputer to use ExpressVPN though. All you have to do is open up the app and click one button. ExpressVPN also works on all devices from laptops to TVs and quietly protects you in the background. Most of the time, whether I'm using it at home or on the go, I don't even realize that it's on. It's really that convenient. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash spiked. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash spiked. And you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash spiked. I mean, we should come on to talk about some of the, um, what this might be a, a, a symptom of. Um, we've sort of alluded to multiculturalism earlier and identity politics. And I, you've um, written a few good pieces on that recently. Um, how how would you explain what the the relationship is between between those things and the sort of violence we're seeing now? Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly, I think it it is a complicated uh, cocktail of lots of different things. But I think um, you know, for essentially the last for several decades, really, um, in the UK, um, there has been essentially an establishment. Um, agreement within institutions within the government that you engage with people explicitly on racial terms that mm. you know not the promotion of a a meaningful sense of citizenship um uh, our, our common humanity our commonality as as british individuals but you know resources um uh, thoughts ideas are explicitly um delineated within racial lines and um if you question that um many people will argue that that you're racist or anything um, you know adjacent to that, and what I think that this has done, um, or at least it has emboldened those over um, the last few years, but longer, is to encourage. I think, as um, Tom alluded to, a uh, white racial consciousness, yeah. um, a, a kind of grievance-based identity, which in many ways is almost a kind of logical conclusion. If you say to people that you know there is a essentially you know a limited amount of resources, um, and that the only way to access those resources is to uh, define yourself in racial terms, yeah. and actually that not just define yourself, but certain racial groups are kind of almost morally superior than others. Mm. That actually, if you are a minority, if you are a religious minority, then that actually um, means that you there's something uh, more morally uh, meaningful and significant um, because you are intrinsically oppressed, um, then there's a kind of equal opposite reaction that gets created. Now, I don't want to exaggerate it and, and uh, assume that this is how, of course, all white people think of themselves, but I think that it creates um, a space for people that perhaps had pre-existing racism yeah. um, to make those similar kinds of arguments mm. in a way that's actually almost parasitically feeding off mm. the dominant yeah. um, narrative and ideology that exists within wider society. They, they almost directly, the far right that is, invert a lot of the sort of woke multicultural slogans like white lives matter is one that patriotic alternative and other sorts of groups of that sort of fascist ilk have latched onto in recent times. Um, and it's it's Clearly, as you say, in, many, in terms of these organisations, it's certainly quite cynical. I mean, they had these dislike, they had this profound hatred for people not like them before they stumbled across, you know, BLM or whatever. Mm. But there's clearly um, a desire to try and kind of 
say, well, if that's a game that's being played, why can't we flip it on its head? And it's not to say that it's going to appeal to many people, um, but it, again, even it's clearly found root amongst a certain section of the population. That was always kind of inevitable. If you continue to play this game, um, the idea that you would have this sort of setup in which everyone would be encouraged to see themselves in this in this way, but there would never be any white people who would start to think in that certain way <laughs> was always ridiculous. And I think also the way in which um, questions around migration and the illegal, illegal migration issue um, certainly do come into play here as well, which again is not to say that this is any way a sort of legitimate response to it. But the way in which if you think about something like the illegal migration question, the asylum issue has been dealt with, it's almost like if you wanted to design a way which would exacerbate pre-existing tensions within yeah. certain areas and communities, you would end up with the policy that we had. So first and foremost, you know, the fact that no government seems to have been able to get a grip on this particular question, e even as you had conservative governments that were being elected on manifestos to, to deal with problems like immigration on the small boats. You also look about the way in which the um, issue of where sort of migrants were processed or would live. I mean, so many different analysis over the years have pointed out that they are, they're predominating in the most impoverished areas in, in the country. Yeah. Um, places in which they might have fought for a very long time to have a particular local amenity. It suddenly gets turned over to be asylum accommodation. Or you've got, you know, the only hotel in town, which is suddenly, you know, can't be booked up for the wedding reception, can't be booked up for this because it's now being used to deal with this growing backlog of um, asylum claims that the government and the state seems incapable of processing and it's a combination it's just the accommodation is cheaper in those areas it's also yeah. why you see a lot of them have been moved to northern ireland um and also another thing which um the tories definitely don't want to talk about they, they did it in a lot of labor areas as well which were you know before a few elections ago quite solidly labor quite solidly poor and working class so it's as i say the vast majority of people even in those areas as much as they are kind of smarting from the refusal to take concerns about migration and multiculturalism seriously as much as they are being kind of pitted by the current setup into a horrendous kind of competition for resources. Um, it, the vast majority of them would never dream of doing what has happened across the country at the moment. But at the yeah. same time, if you wanted to create at least even a small audience for the kind of hard right rhetoric saying, you know, they're playing that you know they're prioritizing them over you they're out to get you they're trying to replace you if you wanted to cre mm. create even a small audience for that you would have an asylum policy like the one that we've had yeah, over definitely. the course of the past yeah. 10 years and it's the way in which you there is this sense that you cannot talk about it yeah. like all of these things it's you know it the, it becomes a highly sensitive discussion mm. and actually you know what um things to do with national security, things to do with, um, you know, our borders, you know, our, our national identity. These should be the kinds of discussions that we would want to have out in the open in a, you know, really dynamic way with lots of different perspectives. And I mean, you know, when it comes to issues to do with, um, you know, Islamist extremism, as as uh, Tom mentioned, uh, oftentimes, you know, there's a total shutting down of the discussion or it gets turned into something completely different when it came to uh, issues like social media civility or um, when it comes to the things that um, people have been concerned about, about uh, the crimes that have been committed by asylum seekers and other people like that, um, the discussion gets moved into something completely different. So you create this situation again, where uh, you create a vacuum mm. where there will be people, even if yeah. you're not gonna talk about it, there will be people that will talk about it. Yeah. And there might not be the kinds of people that you like. Um, and, and therefore you can't then complain um, when these, I think, you know, agitators, opportunistic actors, influencers, and people like that come and talk about all of these issues, yeah. um, when there is a chilling silence in the mainstream discussion. Yeah, definitely. Because also, you know, it is the, these things do cause problems and people, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, they're not making it up. There's a kind of sense, if you look on Twitter at the moment, it's like if only the Daily Mail would shut up about immigration, people wouldn't care about it. But actually a lot of this is, is based on people's lived experiences. Mm -hmm. And the gaslighting has played a big role as well in mm. sort of emboldening the bad actors, I suppose, because if you're the ones who are willing to say, you know, the idea that two-tier policing is nonsense, like what they're taking you for fools, you know, the people who are kind of willing to point out the, again, if, if <coughs> the mainstream isn't honest and, even, and if the alternative media isn't strong enough, then it's going to fall to the fringes and the extremes um, who will be able to capitalise on those kinds of situations. We've definitely seen that. I think it's also worth stressing as well that the kind of coming apart of Britain and British society at the edges that we're talking about here. It's also not limited to questions of the kind of white majority versus everything else. I know there's yeah. something you've written about for us this week in our in terms of the Birmingham rights and 
2005, which would be great to talk a bit more about. But there's even a kind of intra-ethnic component to a lot of the discussion around these riots as well, around the edges. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff flying around social media, basically suggesting, you know, propounding this point to sort of Islamist leaning people, I suppose, that um, these riots are basically Zionist funded. I mean, yeah. there was a video that James O'Brien had to apologize for praising because he didn't realize it was a Muslim gentleman talking about how, you know, we haven't, we're not going to part with your racism. We're going to defend our places of worship and so on. But at the end, he talks about their Zionist paymasters. <laughs> James <laughs> O'Brien didn't see the full clip, so hastily praised it. Mm. But there's a lot of content like that doing yeah, the Tom, rounds. Tommy Robinson's accused of being a sort of Zionist. Exactly. Well, so there's, like that, there's a yeah. lot of that stuff kind of doing the rounds as well. Um, and also, if you just think about the Islamist agitation that we've seen post October the 7th, mm. the fact that there was you know someone arrested last weekend for doing a Nazi salute at a pro-Palestine peace demo um it's a reminder that this is not as simply about you know the kind of white majority or a section of the white majority kicking off against the rest the, broadly speaking over the course of recent decades there's been this kind of intra-ethnic tension as well yeah intra-ethnic minority tension which is as much of a symptom of this coming apart as anything else that we've been talking about yeah and, and now do you want to talk a bit about birmingham because there are some really interesting parallels and in, you know yeah, no, I, I would just, just on that point, I was actually just as an observer at the um, counter demo that took place in uh, North Finchley uh, mm. yesterday. And I think, you know, some people have raised awareness of some of the po posters promoting it that said, you know, um, fascist, racist and Zionist out of Finchley. I mean, yeah. it was crazy. And the um, uh, CEO of JW3, which is a Jewish kind of creative organization, he was at the demo, but, you know, went to a different part where there, uh, there weren't these uh, uh, people saying these things, but I was there and it was just practically a pro-Palestine demo. You yeah. know, they were literally just sh shouting things about Palestine um, more than anything. And I just think that that's also just um, the way in which some of these organizations are um, seemingly just excluding anti-Semitism mm. uh, when it comes to their anti-racism is, uh, is very telling. But on the point about uh, the intra-ethnic tensions, um, there has been long-standing intra-ethnic tensions in different parts of the UK that, again, many in the kind of cultural and media establishment would prefer to brush under the carpet because yeah. it doesn't really demonstrate that um, this white versus the rest narrative. And I wrote about in spite um, the 2005 uh, Birmingham riots, uh, which were very interesting in terms of their parallels to some of the things that went on today, which was a riot between uh, British Jamaican people um, and largely British Pakistani people, um, partly over the fact that um, the multicultural policies um, of Birmingham Council explicitly distributed resources mm. on the grounds of very, uh, you know, on the grounds of these c categories that really had no meaning or authority or democratic mandate within those communities. Um, but they essentially created um, particular identities where the Jamaican community who um, were not as economically advanced as the Pakistani community at that particular time, um, started to resent um, the, the Asian community because of their economic advancement, partly you know, driven by the fact that actually resources were being distributed in that way. Hmm. And you can see then again, how um, you know, otherwise communities that share very similar challenges in relation to economic inequality um, and all sorts of things come to then see their problems, their class issues in racial terms. Yeah. And you you see that in many different ways. And I think Rakib is also, Rakib Hassan's written about in Spike, the, the, the Leicester riots more yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, which, Everyone's forgotten about that entirely. Well, yeah, it, but it, exactly. But what between it, Muslims and Hindus in this case, yeah. And so anyone regardless of background could be you know susceptible to thinking in this way mm. because this is explicitly how we've organized society yeah and it's interesting how the you know the birmingham riots were kicked off by a rumor i think that you know a black woman raped by an asian man completely not true but very similar to how a rumor in the southport instance about uh, an, uh, the killer the suspect being an asylum seeker that lit the spark of a, a sort of pre-existing fuse in a, in a way exactly and it, it tells you again that censorship is not the answer mm. because actually even in a time where there wasn't social media in the same way yeah. um rumors malicious rumors can mm. spread because they may well speak to pre-existing anxieties um and come to represent something different um and so in the case of um in, in the case of birmingham the, there was the rumor that you mentioned which was spread on uh pirate radio stations and certain websites um and people were saying horrific things um, about, you know, 
the black community and the Asian community. And this got thousands of people out in the streets yeah. and actually two people died as a result of those riots. Um, so I think it is very interesting that lots of the, uh, the questions that were even being risen 20 years ago, mm. they've even become more entrenched now. And if not exaggerated when it comes to the politics of identity and wider society. And we still don't seem to be learning those lessons. Definitely. Tom, do you want to add anything finally? Well, I'm just sort of thinking about the way out of this. And, and that's obviously uh, surrounds a lot of the arguments that we've been making as far as we need to find that kind of shared identity needing to kind of do away with this horrendous sort of multicultural ghettoization of individuals both literally and kind of psychologically mm -hmm. um and at the same time with such a lack of confidence that there's any other kind of infrastructure to deal with that i thought some of the um demonstrations that we've seen this week the kind of anti-racist counter demonstrations i mean if you see all the people in walthamstow say i'm sure the vast majority of these people aren't going to be sort of SWP <laughs> types. Yeah. Um, but that's certainly what the placards were. So, you know, socialist workers stand up to racism, which last time I checked was still dominated by those kind of socialist worker party types. Um, I should be careful how I put this, but on uh, the two days after October the 7th, the socialist worker, their newspaper, put out a comment piece that said rejoice. Mm. So if these are the people that were looking to fight racism, on a, then we're on a hiding to nothing. And what I worry about in terms of the more broader establishment is that there's going to be an attempt to meet this form of white identity politics, this kind of vicious white identity politics, with just more identity politics. Yeah. And it will therefore just continue to feed the dynamic which has existed. And um, I think it's also going to really expose the limitations of Keir Starmer because people compare him a lot to Tony Blair. Um, and yet when you saw things like the Birmingham riots flare up during the kind of new Labour years, even though um, he didn't handle it particularly well, he was clearly slight, there was clearly more of a discussion going on within kind of new Labour right establishment circles about what had been going wrong with multiculturalism. Blair has, been, has made more criticisms of it, certainly around the edges than anyone else. But in the, in the form of Starmer, we just have a, an even more sort of shallow uh, wouldn't want to say anything that would upset the Guardian comment page type of politician. Mm. So any sort of hope that he's going to kind of pivot away from the immediate crackdown stage to actually thinking about what might have gone wrong, I just don't see it. Um, I think in terms of the establishment more broadly, they seem to want to ignore the evidence of their own eyes and all kinds of problems. So I think where this discussion has got to be is amongst is amongst ordinary people and to, and to just push back against this new racial thinking because we're not going to... If we're waiting to get that from the general establishment or the quote-unquote anti-racist establishment we're going to be waiting for a very long time i think thank you so much for watching the spikes podcast we'll be back next friday if you hit subscribe and click the bell you'll never miss an episode and in the meantime why not check out all of spikes other videos and podcasts on this channel and for more spiked content find us at spiked